Now, hello everyone, my name is Johannes, and welcome to my talk, Guard Real-Time Networking at Home. And it's subtitled, Why Many Systems Are Moving to TSN So Slowly. Um, basically, I am a kernel developer at Pangotronics now, but I have been working for like 10-ish years in the industry, mostly as a systems engineer working on real-time proprietary networks. So. What do I mean by proprietary networks? Well, they were using partly open standards, partly closed source stuff, and we're partially working on proprietary network stacks. So most of them weren't actually using Linux. And I experienced quite some pain with that and quite some violations of real-time properties. So we will have a look into what those real-time properties are and why we want to have them. Um, by now, I'm working for Pingotronics, uh, which is a Linux consulting company uh, located in Germany. And yeah, so let's just start into the talk. I want to give you some, basically two ex application examples on uh, why and what of the real-time properties we want to use and what the requirements are for that, uh, how legacy implementations aimed to achieve that most of them worked quite okay-ish in most situations. And we will talk about uh, how to move brownfield towards TSN. So what we can do if a um, already deployed solution is out there in the field and we need to move that towards TSN. In the end, we will talk about uh, what Linux networking can do at that point, And we will have a short outlook on what may be coming next to TSN. So, Let's go into that. Um, what do you want um, real-time networking for? Basically, every time we want to deploy data over the network, when it's absolutely crucial that the data arrives in a timely manner at the endpoint. For example, that's the two fields I will mostly focus on because that's the fields I worked in. Uh, one is machine control, basically. So you have huge production plant. There is like coordinated motion into that production plant and you have like multiple servo motors just working on several motions. You don't want those to crash. You may have control loops that have requirements on timing. Uh, so really, really bad things happen when timing is violated in that place. The other one is audio video bridging, like for setups like this here, uh, you might want to transmit audio or video, hence the name over the network, uh, for example, for a PA application as we have here. And you, of course, want, don't want your audio to have dropouts and live audio, for example. So that's the two things I will focus on today, especially for examples. I have some more stories for you in the end if we have some more time after the questions. And other areas may include like aerospace, automotive, and stuff like that, of course. Yeah. Thank you. So that's basically what we are going to look into. And first of all, what is the first building block, if you will, at a very large scale of TSM is time synchronization. So we have different devices in the network, and those have to basically have a common sense of how time is passing. So I chose that uh, old fashioned picture there because basically that is what the network is doing. Usually we use like PTP, precision time protocol for that. Uh, or in the case of uh, TSM, we usually use GPTP, um, which is standardized in 802.1 AS. And what it does is basically it compares who has the most precise time in our network and will distribute time from that point of view, will compensate for delays in the network. And basically, that's from a very, very um, general point of view what um, time synchronization does. And basically, everything else in our network depends on the different nodes having this common sense of time. Because if you switch on a device, it has like a crystal oscillator, which runs at a speed. And that speed isn't really common for all devices. That's 
no problem for most applications, but for TSN applications, you need them to be really, really, really good synchronized or synchronized. And uh, the other thing is, of course, you don't switch on your devices at the same time. So basically, clock starts at counter zero. And if you switch them on at a different point in time, uh, your counters will be different. So you need really need to distribute that common sense of now it's like a certain point in time. The second thing we have is like bounded transmission latency. Um, let's look, for example, in uh, an audio application. Um, you have like a chain of a source and different um, bridges in your network. Um, TSN usually talks about bridges. Um, which most of the time is a switch, can also could also be a router, but in general think of that um, uh, synonymally. Um, so basically every time a packet goes in to that, say, switch, it will be in the input queue, it will be switched to an output queue, and it will leave the um, bridge at a certain point in time, and of course, over the network that will cause some delay, path delay on the overall network. Now, if you want to play out the packets at different points in the network, of course, we need to give that packet a play at timestamp so that if you have like a left and a right speaker in the room, both play out the audio at the same time or otherwise strange things will happen. So what happens if we have like interfering packets and interfering traffic into uh, that, within that network. Well, basically, there is another source connected to the switch because, well, having a row of switches is not a really good application, right? So you have something else connected here. And whilst that source is sending data throughout the network, say, in that direction, um, those packets stored in that input queue or output queue, depending on where, will have to be queued, of course. And their playout will be delayed. And if you, say, have one source being played out at uh, the old time and the other isn't being delivered in time, you run into really, really huge problems. So what you want to guarantee is an overall bounded transmission latency from one point in the network to the other. And basically, there is no possibility to achieve that with legacy Ethernet because you could always be interrupted by interfering traffic, um, which is one of the most common problems you run into if you are trying to implement um, real-time applications with legacy Ethernet. So the, first, uh, the third thing we have is like, Okay, we could mitigate with, uh, for that by uh, using like priority lanes. The example of that picture is a bus lane. Um, with legacy implementation, usually that's DCP or something like that. We try to implement a quality of service, so the link won't always be enough to send all packets through. So you try to prioritize, prioritize what uh, the packets that are important. And that kind of works okay-ish most of the times, but as, with, as in the traffic, sometimes those rules are violated and then strange things happen. We have actual means in TSN to prevent that, um, but we can't really guarantee that that works for legacy Ethernet. So there is another fourth thing that might be um, important for some applications, some that won't care, which is physical layer redundancy. Um, there are some more, but we will just look at physical layer redundancy. For example, if you run audio, basically, let's have another example. Uh, at the back of this room, there's a mixing desk, and audio is running from the front to the back and back again to the front, to the loudspeakers. And um, you might have that through one cable. And if like a forklift drives over that cable, because that's what happens at conferences, um, your audio system will fail. So you might want to be able to run your audio through redundant links or your signal through redundant links. So if one link fails, the other still works. 
So again, this strongly depends on your application. Some will work okay, or you will have a second channel to account for that. But uh, you really want to actually have that. Also, with like legacy Ethernet, you have to do really strange things to make that happen. Because if you just plug two cables into two bridges, you will get a loop and broadcast storm, and strange things will happen eventually. So, again, let's have a short look at legacy implementation approaches. How did people try to do that? Well, time synchronization is not so far from what TSN does. Usually, they implement PTP or a PTP ish protocol. I've seen quite some strange proprietary stuff there. You actually want to use IEEE 1588 and, or GPTP, but if you are working in that field and if you are going for PTP, that's okay-ish. Um, with GPTP, you can achieve quite tight uh, synchronization. So basically, that's not important for any application. For some, it is. Um, that, again, depends on your application, but that's actually the least problematic thing as long as you're not trying to implement your own PTP um, because there's many pitfalls with that. With the bounded transmission latency, basically, legacy Ethernet is more or less best effort. So if you build your links large enough and you try to pre-calculate your bandwidths in your network, and you try to um, have a proper routing path, and things will probably sometimes work out. But for some applications, that's not really possible because if you're just building a on the fly, just plugging in like stuff for a live application, so if you have an event here and you're just building an audio setup, things will differ from time to time. When you build your audio setup, you will have to adapt to the room, you will have to adapt to the venue, and things will differ from time to time, and you won't have time to pre-calculate all your bandwidth. So that will work for like the industrial control applications most of the times, but it won't work for like live audio video bridging. And last but not least, for quality of service, of course, you can have like traffic segregation, so you can run entire complete disjunct uh, layer one links. You can run two Ethernet cables, one for each traffic class, basically. You can try to use VLANs to segregate your traffic. And you can use like DCP or rate limiting for um, keeping your different uh, traffic classes apart. That will work OK for some applications, but may fail if something uh, yeah, unexpected happens, basically. So if some component in your network fails, stuff has to be rerouted, um, you will experience like strange effects with that. Now, of course, we want to make things better. And nowadays, TSN is the solution for most of those problems. Um, we have in TSN, like a standard set, it turns out to be quite large by now. Um, so we will have um, GPTP for time synchronization. Now that's like a subset or a profile, if you will, of regular PTP. Um, we will have traffic shaping, which will deal with when uh, your prioritized real-time traffic is sent and that it is sent in a timely manner um, and that bandwidth is uh, basically reserved for your real-time traffic and cannot be uh, used for like unimportant traffic. So if you're running like a real-time audio link and someone decides, oh, that looks like internet because there's an Ethernet port, of course, and just plugs in his laptop and watches YouTube, um, your link won't, your audio link won't be affected in any way because it has an acquired bandwidth and the YouTube video stream will have to use the remaining bandwidth. So that's a good thing to have, actually. Um, for network management, we have like different ways we can use like pre-configured stuff with Yang, NetConf, and stuff. Or we can use like the more on-the-fly stuff with like stream reservation and stuff, which comes more from the audio-video bridging times. So back before AVB uh, turned into TSN. 
but both of them work and both of them work quite well. And with PCR and FUR, we also have like um, the building blocks for link layer redundancy. That's again the thing if one layer or one link is run over by a truck, uh, the other will still work. Um, some stuff, of course, are out of scope. Um, TSN is mostly layer two standard. Actually, it is a layer two standard. So stuff like routing is not within the scope of, the T of TSN, which is OK for like smaller applications and as long as you stay into a local area network. But of course, if you want to have um, like a transmission and you want to like transmit, broadcast uh, video data from here over dark fiber to say Porto, um, you are in trouble because you actually want to route that traffic and you want to make use of layer three. So TSN won't help you with that. You have to use layer three on top of that. So again, what is out in the field? Out in the field, deployed, especially for industrial control applications, but also for audio video applications, most of the stuff is basically legacy Ethernet. And most of that stuff is quite really expensive, and it's quite hard to upgrade that stuff. Not only because it's still hard to get TSN-capable hardware, TSN-capable switches still tend to be quite expensive in contrast to like regular um, legacy Ethernet switches. And um, often those old deployed devices don't converge well with TSN because TSN has a higher set of requirements and you won't be able to use TSN until anything in your subsystem is running TSN. So that's quite a big problem in the field because upgrading like a multi hundred thousand euros application, um, you have to have really good reasons to do that. And people will ask you if you, if you tell them, well, now anything's fine and nice. And they will just ask you, well, wasn't it fine in the, in the, uh, in, in the past when you sold me that device and that machine? So they will be quite surprised. And it's hard to um, get people out there moving forward. So one thing I have um, experienced to work quite well is to like uh, go forward piece by piece and upgrade subsystems, upgrade single devices with TSN capable hardware, not using TSN yet, but trying to replace uh, like entire plants piece by piece. Uh, upgrade them subsystem by subsystem, employ gateways to legacy wherever possible, and use TSM capable hardware where you can. Most of the new chips uh, the vendors push out nowadays with Ethernet are TSM capable. That's not entirely true for switches, sadly, but with files and Macs, that's usually true in general, but you will have to look carefully uh, when you like choose, um, choose hardware for building new devices and stuff. Now, of course, we are at a Linux conference, so let's look a short moment on what Linux can do to help with that. Um, most of the stuff, uh, so most of the standards and components are supported in mainline. There will be a talk on that. Uh, so I usually, uh, I recommend to you to uh, visit that talk if you're interested in which are and which aren't. And um, Actually, what we have in Linux is a great basis for stuff for building actual devices and for pushing stuff out in the field. So thank you for anyone uh, who has done some effort there. And um, yeah, I owe you something. And the thing we have to consider with that, uh, if you want to push things forward and want to extend on that, is how we want to design APIs. Um, as I said, TSN is a set, huge set of standards, and they have to interact with each other. And sometimes it's really hard to get all the APIs and all the sets and all the um, presets right. And uh, sometimes we miss some demons and services to put anything together. So the individual parts are there, but 
there's still not great examples on how to actually put things together. So there's something we can improve on as a community. And if you, especially if you are a vendor and want to push like your hardware out, if you want to push your software out, uh, you may want to have like more examples, more reference designs on how to use stuff, on how to enable the system engineers, the application engineers, and the end users to um, actually use TSN on your platform. Um, also, if you're developing stuff, you probably have your own test tools. You probably have your own set of, well, if I use these settings, it works for my setup. Please publish them as well. Because it's very, very hard if you start with that and you try to evaluate a setup, if you try to evaluate a, um, a hardware platform or a set of hard and software, if you're doing a co-design, to get a good starting point. And those test cases, test tools, um, those examples are usually a great way to start. And that will really, really increase the speed with which uh, stuff is uh, pushed out. I know it's a thing that people usually don't like to do because it's a bit hacky and it's not so nice. It does help. So please publish those as well. And as a last um, point on that slide, um, there is more coming up. So as I told you, TSN is basically layer two. And we can build quite interesting stuff on that. But for uh, several applications, that's not enough. So what we actually need is at least a layer three implementation, which is just waiting around the corner. If you want to look into that, I recommend to you to look into the IETF .NET working group because they're really doing a great job. So if you have any connections to them, again, I owe them and uh, say them thank you. And that almost brings me to the end of my talk. Um, as I said, and to uh, sum things up, TSN fills a lot of gaps, which we can, and does a lot of things we can't do with legacy Ethernet. But um, there are still some issues we need to address. .NET will be fill more of these gaps, and probably we will also need to have a look into higher level protocols. What do I mean with that? Well, by now, most companies are just using TSN as a layer two under their old legacy protocols, and that tends not to scale very well. So maybe it's time, if you're into protocol design, um, to have a think or to think about how we can make use of the properties of TSN, of those deterministic properties, and uh, how we can actually um, design better higher layer protocols. So if you're into that and you're interested in that, um, I'd be really, really happy to see more of stuff coming. And yeah, if you are working more in the user space API uh, realm, um, there's one thing I'd ask you for, please try to at least document or provide um, good and same default settings. There's some examples like um, TC, which has, uh, or, or QDisks, which are quite hard to configure right if you're like an application engineer and not deep into the networking stuff. If you haven't had a talk at uh, Alexei's talk, um, maybe you want to uh, listen to a recording because uh, most people's working out in the field with embedded are not really into networking. So they will have a quite hard time figuring out what the right settings are. Again, with examples, with reference designs, we can mitigate for that. But if they don't have to tweak the settings much, that will help as well. And again, we need more debugging validation tools. So I'd love to see uh, some open source validation tool chain out there to make sure that if someone wants to roll TSN, it actually is TSN. And it uh, will actually work well with the standards and with all other standardized components out there. Yeah, well, that's actually it. Again, 
thank you for your attention and um, yeah, visit the TSN building blocks talk because that will go deeper into several of the topics I just touched. It will be on Thursday. Yeah. How much of the old AVB stuff is still the same slash being revived slash unchanged slash? Um, most of it, I'd say, like 95% is still in the TSM standards. There is, I think, two or three like minor changes to some of the um, standards touching on um, traffic shaping because they were incompatible. There was also a hardware issue on that because that's something you really want to have with hardware support. And there were some chips that only supported the old standards and don't really work well with TSM, but it's more or less comp compatible. Great talk, thank you. Um, there was a small note on uh, link layer redundancy, the yeah. FRARE one. Uh, yeah. And you, I think you mentioned that uh, link layer redundancy is part, partially solved with FRARE. And yeah. what did you mean uh, with the partially? Or... Um, for, I think for most applications, that's uh, what FRARE does is absolutely fine. Um, with some applications, you want to have more fine-grained control on the actual path or on the configuration of your path. And basically, as far as I understand it, there will be or you will need to tweak some of the parameters more to achieve what you uh, want to do there. So for, for like rather trivial setups, that's okay. But I think as soon as your networks become more and more complex, that again, it strongly depends on your application. Um, it might not work entirely for any of these. But we... I, I see, yeah, uh, I, I think I see what you meant by that. But uh, Frere, uh, in fact, expect uh, uh, it op only operates at the engineered network. So yeah. it expect uh, you have, for example, three uh, uh, like disjunct uh, passes and uh, you know the expected maximal latency and jitter on every pass. And yeah. that's how you can uh, configure the Frere. Yeah. So, uh, and if you know all of these, uh, Frere works quite good uh, actually. I just, I just wanted yeah. to know. That. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so I think we have like no more questions so far. And if you want to, I just have two more minutes to tell you a war story from the field where something with legacy Ethernet failed, if you want to. Or you can leave and have a break. So let's choose one of these. Um, and I think I will choose that one, which was actually discovered by a colleague of mine. So they were working in a large uh, production environment, basically a large manufacturing plant, and many of uh, different machines were interconnected by a network. And they discovered that sometimes some of the motor drives that push out stuff on a conveyor belt failed to push out, actually push out the stuff on the conveyor belt and pulled back too late and actually crashed some of the product, uh, produced goods. And they worked really, really hard several weeks on um, discovering how or why those things maybe have happened until they discovered that it, it happened at uh, very special times of day. So they looked into the logs and someone had the idea to just watch if there's any football games in the TV at that time. And actually there were, and some of the plant workers were streaming uh, video over the plant network, which was for reasons connected to the internet. And yeah, basically that caused a denial of service on uh, the motion data, which told the drives where to put the stuff. So I think that's exactly on time. 
that wouldn't have happened with TSN. So that's my talk. Thank you.